Excellent. Oh, it is my great pleasure to welcome Susan Chang, who is uh, wearing so many hats that I think for the first time I actually need a cheat sheet to list all the things that she's doing. So some of uh, the hints you've got up here, uh, because she's the vice chair and also the founding member of the IUCN, uh, hold on, uh, Species Survival Commission, yeah, Climate Specialist Group section on small apes. Uh, she is also co-director of Borneo uh, Nature Foundation International. She is senior lecturer at Oxford Brookes University, and she's also the co-founder and director of Burrito River Initiative for Nature Conservation and Communities. And those of you who went to Brookes Science Bazaar last weekend, uh, not directly the last, but the last before that, uh, would have seen Susan surrounded by Lego blocks making little Lego apes and Lego jungle uh, and Lego huts and Lego trees. Um, and you might have guessed that she's into Lego just a lot. Um, but Susan is also into all things given, and this is what she will talk to us about today. So over to you, Dr. Susan Jane, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm assuming this is working. Yeah. Marvellous. Um, yes, lots of acronyms for the, the IUCN likes to use. But yes, basically anything given. And although I will focus on where I've been working now for, gosh, 23 years in uh, Indonesia, I'm going to cover, I hope, all of the fabulous singing, swinging apes. Um, so as Johanna mentioned, the, the section on small apes, there, within the IUCN, there is a section on the big apes, a section on great apes. Um, and it was realized so that while well, the gibbons were somewhat neglected, forgotten amongst the apes, they are apes, just a little bit smaller. And per the purposes of the SSA is really to try to bring everyone together. Um, I'll discuss the, the geographical range of the gibbons um, shortly, but basically we have 11 countries and 20 species. That's an awful lot of people doing an awful lot of work on these species. Um, also a very large variety of languages um, in which we somehow have to communicate and share information. And the purpose of the SSA is really to do that. If you want to find more about it, it's a nice easy website. It's www.gibbons.asia. <clears throat> really easy. But it is basically about bringing everyone together so that we can identify knowledge gaps, so that we can increase awareness of what we know and indeed don't know about these wee apes. And importantly, promote IUCN endorsed guidelines. And we're continuously working on these. We've also got to think about action plans, and I'll come back to these uh, towards the end. Is the IUCN red list up to date? To be honest, by the time we've completed one assessment, it's time to do another one because we're developing, not developing, finding new species, but also direct technical support. And I'll talk about this a, a bit later, but sadly, over the last few years, an increasing number of rescue centers are needed to deal with gibbons being taken out of the wild for the illegal wildlife trade. So what do we know? Well, we have now, when I started my PhD, some number of years ago, we recognized 12 species in 2000. We now recognize 20. Five of them on the IUCN red list critically endangered, 14 endangered, and one only listed as vulnerable. And of these, at least three species have absolutely no captive breeding program or none in captivity. That's the Hainan gibbon, uh, which is only found on the island of Hainan off the southern coast of China. <coughs> Calvet gibbon, which is on the border between uh, Vietnam and China. Um, and Skywalker, found in uh, China. And I think I can probably tell you this because the paper is just about to come out. We have confirmed a large uh, presence of Skywalker gibbon in Myanmar, uh, a particularly difficult and challenging place to do conservation work. Now, they do look different. <coughs> um, and um, getting decent photographs of, uh, of, of these things that swing up in the trees at quite high speed is rather challenging. So um, we got this little infographic together to try and demonstrate 
not just the differences, but just how amazing they look. They are the singing, swinging apes. They are pretty much 100% arboreal. They really do, do not come to the ground. Um, and they have this incredible uh, song in, in the morning. Now, I forgot to include one, um, a song within this. <coughs> There's a few people in the audience that know me, and I'm not going to sing because I'm also losing my voice. But one of the most magical things about them is their duet. Now, let's hope this works. They're just warming up. I hope you could hear that, and I hope you appreciate that it was much better than me doing it. Um, but yes, that tends to happen about four o'clock in the morning. Um, and that was just one pair. They live in uh, um, mostly um, uh, single male, single adult female units, with some variety uh, as you go north towards uh, China and Vietnam. But yes, if we want to survey them, study them, find them, we've got to be up before they do, which is quite early. So, unfortunately, across the geographic range, uh, so as far south as the island of Java, <clears throat> um, and as far west as um, Bangladesh and uh, Assam in India, huge geographic range, huge climactic variation, geographic variation, variation in habitat, and therefore variation in food availability. Unfortunately, of course, all threatened by um, habitat loss. As I mentioned, they are almost completely arboreal. Very simply, no trees, no gibbons. Despite this very large geographical range, and again, I appreciate there are many, many, many species that are severely understudied, but compared to the big apes, if you look at publications on chimpanzees and bonobos going back to the mid 80s, vastly increasing number and focus indeed on papers going up to over uh, 2000, and this was only going up to 2016. A few less on the various gorilla species, but still a strong traje trajectory rather of increased uh, publications. Orangutans, uh, just a little bit behind that, on all three species. Uh, again, the recently uh, described Tapanuli orangutan in Sumatra. And if you think about the small gibbons, um, so these are from the genera Nomascus, Hylobates, and um, Hulok. Well, we're getting pretty low numbers here. And then the Siamang, which is the one with the nice big throat sac that has this fantastic booming call that I definitely cannot do. Um, we're really looking at very, very low numbers compared to the big apes, which means, unfortunately, we have very large knowledge gaps. And of course, knowledge gaps are not ideal when we want to conserve them. Um, oh, sorry, that should be 11. But again, what we do have is good knowledge about the species distribution, a good knowledge about the species identification, and a really large amount of data that has been gathered. The problem with a lot of it is that it's difficult to share because a lot of it has been published in the country, in the language where the study was done. But English being the language of, of science, a lot of this means it's difficult to access. So one of the biggest challenges of the SSA is again, to go back in and find this incredible work and make it available. 
But if we think about some of the problems and challenges facing gibbons, some of the many, well, if you need trees, if you always, you always need trees, then fragmentation and loss of habitat connectivity is a, is a huge problem. Increasingly, though, we're starting to see quite a lot of success with can canopy bridges. And there's a huge amount of work being done on how to design the, be the best bridge. It's not just a single rope, um, because, you know, imagine arboreal animals meeting each other in the middle. You know, who has right of way? Bit of a fight can ensue. So best materials, over what distance can you build these bridges? Uh, how do you provide, you know, passing spaces? Um, what other animals use these bridges? Law optimizing law enforcement. Now that in and of itself is not a, uh, an achievable goal. Yes, of course we need better law enforcement. We need better law enforcement for all kinds of wildlife uh, in, in, in this country as well. But we need to break those down into actual actions. What can we actually do? Optimizing law enforcement is not in and of itself um, an achievable action. What within that can we get done? Definitely stopping hunting. But again, it's not just hunting. Why are people buying gibbons and many other species of wildlife um, to keep as pets? What are the drivers behind someone going out and hunting? What's the driver behind somebody selling? And what is the driver behind the person who actually goes out and buys it? And those will vary between countries as well. And again, a nice big aim, but has to be broken down into actual achievable units or blocks of action, stopping and controlling um, habitat loss and forest conversion, particularly um, in Indonesia, vast swathes of the forests are being cleared for um, palm oil plantations. So again, thinking about this very broad approach of the kinds of things we have to do and breaking it down into something where we can actually use sound science to influence and inform our conservation decisions and actions, which also then allows us to go back and say, okay, if it worked, good, carry on. If it didn't, why? What do we need to fix? Habitat protection, maintaining that connectivity and trying to replant it and rebuild it where we can, using canopy bridges as an interim measure. Monitoring the populations. We need to know how many there are and whether or not those populations are changing, declining, increasing or stabilizing, depending on the actions we're taking. Captive management, now that's a whole talk in and of itself, whether you are trying to link uh, rescue centers with zoos, with the wild, but particularly in this instance, I'm talking about the rescue centers that are taking animals out of the wildlife trade and if possible, rehabilitating them to return them to the wild. Everything we do within conservation, I fully believe has to involve people. We are the problem in so, so many ways, but I believe we can also be the solution. And there is, of course, no, not only one solution. And translocation, so moving a wild animal from a place where it is threatened or endangered or isolated in a forest fragment uh, to a safe place. Problematic, difficult, especially when you're dealing with speedy little gibbons very high up in a tree in a family unit and you have to try and translocate them all. Possible, but very much a last resort. So breaking that down again into the units where we can actually try and achieve something. Well, one of the things that's a particular problem in Indonesia is fire. A lot of the habitats where we, uh, forest habitats where we find gibbons and indeed orangutans and my other great love, the cats, uh, clouded leopards and all the others, and many wonderful other species, pangolins, are on peat swamp. These peat swamp forests are, um, have been targeted for illegal logging and canals are cut into them through which the timber is extracted. Those canals drain the peat. Dry peat burns, as um, my Scottish ancestors know very well. Dry peat makes great fires and great whiskey. It makes really, really bad situation for wildlife though. And unfortunately, these fires are almost annual. They just vary in intensity. So preventing these fires, re-wetting the peat, blocking these canals. I got that right, yes. Blocking the canals. Building dams, not building more canals. Um, but indeed also working within 
um, authorities and with development to try and prevent any new developments, or rather than prevent them, at least make sure they are as environmentally friendly as possible. Of course, one area where there's still a lot of development that could be looked at is looking at reduced emissions through degradation and deforestation, red plus, um, basically carbon credits. Um, that is a, again, that could be an entire talk in and of itself. But prevention is better than a cure. If we can prevent the fires from starting in the first place, that's a lot easier than the epic task of trying to rebuild the forest. Although with uh, Borneo Nature Foundation, we're aiming for by next year, at least a million trees planted. Not quite trees, they're gonna be saplings, but they will become trees. And within this, of course, habitat protection has to again involve people. People in the communities in and around these forests, not just protected areas, but working with people to establish patrol units protecting the forest, and indeed with um, indigenous and local communities, giving them ownership over their own land. So working within the legal systems of the country, in this case, Indonesia, to create these community, social or, or cultural forests, which are within the law, and that gives ownership back to the people. Again, trying to break down, we need better law enforcement. Yes, how? Well, we need to identify where illegal activity is happening, why, when, and what we can do to combat it. And it, patrol teams working with people, again, in the local environment to identify where things are happening. And embracing new technology. Um, camera traps, I love camera traps, not just because we get these wonderful pictures of the cats. Camera traps, drones, passive acoustic recording, all of these different tools. And again, they're tools because I argue that whilst they are amazing, you still need boots on the ground, you still need to be going running around um, and getting hot and muddy and sweaty in the forest. Um, but with patrolling as well, uh, this spatial monitoring and reporting tool developed by the Zoological Society of London, which allows patrol teams to actually track what they're doing rather than just walking around the forest to actually have some real um, data to determine uh, what they're doing and allow them to feed back into their own um, activities. Again, giving them more ownership over what they're doing. So these are some examples, <coughs> not all given, um, some examples of different kinds of rope bridges. Um, so the one in the top, left, yes. Um, that's on the island of Hainan, so that's with the Hainan gibbon. It's the world's most endangered, probably primate. Um, there are 37 individuals in the whole world in this one um, part of a national park on the island of Hainan. But again, thinking about it, if you build it, they won't necessarily come and use it. Um, different kinds of materials. Primates are very tactile. Um, and again, thinking about the types of material, how robust is it? If a primate encounters something new, they're generally going to investigate it. That often means investigating with their teeth. Therefore, if you have to build something, you've got to make sure it is robust enough to with, with, sorry, withstand um, really quite large canines having a go at it. And of course, if it does get broken, that it does not then produce any um, uh, materials that might damage any of the wildlife. So there were huge amounts of effort, people having so much fun designing all these kinds of things um, and then running into um, interesting complications when they come to ask the local authorities to put these up. Um, and uh, in one case in, in Singapore, the authorities are like, well, so it's not an electricity line, no. Is it a telephone line, no. It's a bridge, but it's not for humans, no. We don't have any legislation for this, so we don't know what permit to give you. Well, that means we don't need a permit. Okay, fine. Um, so it's, it's, it's causing a little bit of confusion amongst the uh, bureaucrats, shall we say. Population monitoring of gibbons. Now, the, basically, the unit of measurement is the song. A gibbon pair will duet. There are some species that don't duet at exactly the same time, but we'll come back to those. But basically, that is how you can identify a group. 
and at a mated male and female. And by triangulating those calls in the same way your mobile phone is triangulated, basically that's how we can work out how many groups there are in a particular area. It's a little bit more complicated than that because on any given day, a group might not sing. Um, maybe just the male will sing. Always, always, always the male will start first. And most of the time, the female will join in with him. Um, I've certainly been out plenty of times where the female just is like, nah, and just hasn't bothered. And the poor male is singing for a good hour and the female just doesn't join in. Um, of course, if it's been absolutely throwing it down with rain overnight, funnily enough, they're cold, wet and miserable. The last thing they want to do is get up and sing. They just want to find breakfast. So, of course, if you go out the day after, sorry, the day after a big, heavy rainstorm, probably not going to hear any gibbons. That's going to limit your surveying. But interestingly, the, the way of actually collecting the survey data in the field really hasn't changed since the, the early 80s. What has changed is how we analyze it. Increasingly, we're using more powerful analytical tools through um, R. So this, um, using a, actually a technique that was developed initially for camera traps, um, spatially, spatially e explicit capture recapture, looking at the movement of animals in space, we've now got auditory um, explicit capture recapture for um, the gibbons. And so understanding these populations, just getting a snapshot um, is great. But again, if you do this over time, um, you can start to see trends. You can see trends in different areas of large blocks of forest, and you can identify, hopefully, what's going on and use these data to be able to make management decisions or at least recommendations. The illegal wildlife trade is a huge problem for, well, so many species, but since we're talking about gibbons. Um, oh dear, nine years ago now, we published the best practice, best practice guidelines uh, on gibbon rehabilitation and translocation, um, which needs updating, oh dear, something else to do. Um, but the idea is, is that we brought together everyone who at the time was running rescue centers, was rescuing gibbons from the pet trade, uh, undertaking rehabilitation and where appropriate reintroduction, um, and basically work out what we were all doing and what the best way of doing it was. Sadly, in the last four years, uh, two countries which previously had no need for uh, rescue centers because they didn't have a really big problem with gibbons in the pet trade have had to open rescue centers. Um, that is Laos and um, Bangladesh. Increasingly, gibbons are being kept as pets there. They weren't before. And so using all of this, we are hoping that trying to combat the trade, but also by work, everybody working together, we are not reinventing the wheel um, in all the different countries. We are sharing our successes. Most importantly, also, we're sharing what didn't work. And that's often quite a big problem in conservation. We're very reluctant to say what didn't work because it looks like we failed. Even with the best of intentions, not everything works. And the only way we will learn from that is by talking to each other about it. Something that's been promoted quite recently is a catch-all for income generation as much as anything else is ecotourism. Um, through one of the other sections of the primate specialist group, literally just in the last week, we've published um, guidelines, uh, both for people who want to go and see primates in, in the wild um, and the tour operators that are promoting these um, so that people can see primates in the wild. But so it is done to protect primates as much as protecting the humans. Um, so it's done in the best possible way. And those are in the process of being translated um, into lots of different languages. So it is absolutely possible but it's definitely not a catch-all. It's definitely not a panacea where it's going to solve all of our problems. Um, but, you know, there's nothing better than waking up in the morning and hearing gibbons. Well, actually, if you wake up and hear gibbons, you're late. You should be up and out of bed and dressed and in the forest before you hear them. Uh, anyway. Um, but, you know, the nice thing about gibbons' song is it is just amazing. I'm sorry I didn't have it on the computer, but go to gibbons.asia and there's loads of... Um, songs for 
Not all, but many of the different species. Because the great thing about Gibbon Song across all of these 11 countries is that every single country has multiple myths and legends relating to the gibbons. Very clearly about gibbons. Very clearly not any other species. Not a monkey. Definitely not any of the, any of the, any of the apes. The only other ape is an orangutan. So there's a huge amount of cultural awareness about gibbons across all of these different countries. Um, and hopefully this year, last year for International Gibbon Day, 24th of October, every year, um, and it's on the website, we, we highlighted some of these stories uh, from all of the different Gibbon countries. And there's lots of similarities and lots of variation within that as well. And I'm really hoping that this year um, we can launch more of a kind of artistic cultural project to document these stories fully, because many of them are still or oral traditions. Um, and may be lost. So this link to culture, um, here on the right are some of the uh, kids we work with, uh, with BNF, um, performing their traditional Dayak dancing. Um, uh, Ranger workshop in the middle, and on the left is um, our little Gibbon book, which was published in English and Indonesian. Translocation People may be aware of this. It's often featured on, um, uh, with orangutan rescue centers where orangutans are moved from, say, a palm oil plantation uh, to somewhere considerably safer. It's largely as a result of fragmentation with gibbons, uh, less so with gibbons going into palm oil plantations, although that actually is a gap. We're not really sure if they use palm oil plantations, if they even consume uh, the plants, the palm plants that the orangutans do. Um, we definitely know that for fragmentation results in the gibbons being forced to the ground. Um, gibbons don't do well on the ground. Yes, they are apes. Yes, they are bipedal. They have these incredibly long limbs. And um, you can find a few interesting YouTube videos of what a gibbon looks like walking bipedally. I'm not going to demonstrate. Um, they're not designed to be on the ground. Um, but when they're forced to come to the ground because they have to travel between fragments for food, they can come into contact with dogs. They're more susceptible uh, to parasites. So there have been some successful uh, translocations, but it really is a last resort. It's not, again, a solution that should be the first port of call. <clears throat> but in many situations, particularly something that we think might need to happen with uh, gibbons in Bangladesh is while there is a substantial population of gibbons in Bangladesh, it's pretty much all in highly fragmented forests. There is no really large intact uh, forest in Bangladesh apart from, um, I hope I pronounce this right, right Lawachara, uh, but even there, the largest population of gibbons is only about 500. And this is the thing, although um, Behaviorally, they're very, very similar. Um, Size-wise, very, very similar. The conservation implications and actions needed are very different across each country. There are some similarities, but it does mean that we can't can just take what's being done in Indonesia and transfer it immediately to other places. What does unfortunately transfer across all, pretty much all the countries where um, there is internet access is that since the pandemic, the majority of trade in uh, infant gibbons, and those are the ones you tend to find for sale uh, in markets, is now online um, across all platforms, um, but particularly Facebook and Instagram. Um, TikTok is, you know, increasing in its gibbons for sale. Yay. Um, and this is quite open. If you know the right words to look for in the right language, um, and these are some of the ones you can... Fine, so some of them will have the, the name Gibbon, Siamang, Unko, Wa, those are the Indonesian names, Monyet, Monkey, um, Jual, uh, Sale, Animal, Animal Lovers, um, I've missed that boneka, Doll. Uh, you could probably sit here now and go online and find a Gibbon for sale, please don't. Actually, if you do, tell me. But what we're also trying to look at is, well, what's actually happening? Because it's not just about gibbons for sale. As I mentioned, there are hunters, there are sellers, and there are buyers. 
So what we're looking at here is in green is it uh, people who want to sell a given. Uh, red is people who are online saying, I want to buy a given. Where can I find one? Um, and then in blue is uh, the number of givens. Um, and it is very varying, but what we can see is there are people who are actively going out there and saying, I want a given, where can I get one? So again, these different groups of people potentially have different reasons about why they're selling, buying, wanting. And again, it's not just going to be one campaign or one message that is necessarily going to speak to everybody. Oh, this is a nice moment. Um, Again, this is just an example of the keywords that are being used to advertise if you have a given for sale. Uh, please don't advertise, don't sell given. Uh, so WA, which is the main Indonesian word for given, uh, or CMI, uh, UNCO, um, no keywords, uh, or uh, black monkey. Um, so they're not really disguising this in terms of sale. With uh, the Givenesia campaign, again, we've been looking at where and this is just for online, um, because most of this was done during the pandemic. Um, that's not to say that there aren't still givens for sale in markets. And this is where the majority of the givens, so uh, red is a, a high density of trade accounts of givens for sale. Uh, yellow is medium, blue is low um, and sort of grey. I think the only place in grey is Bali, um, uh, is we had no data. So most of the sales are occurring on the islands of Java and Sumatra. Oh, I have a pointer. Do I have a pointer? Yeah. Java um, and Sumatra, um, less in Kalimantan. Now, this is just for Indonesia. This is only where we've got the most information. And this is trade within Indonesia. This is not international trade. This is just trade of these animals within the country. There is, this is not all completely depressing. I realize this is a bit depressing. Um, when we look at the species, now bearing in mind quite often these infants are less than two years old, sometimes, sometimes less than a year. And while the pictures and infographics I showed earlier, as an adult, it's reasonably easy if you know what you're looking for to tell them apart. As an infant, it's like, gibbon. Um, so when we can identify, so the majority of the ones on sale are the CMIs, with the, the ones with the black ones with the throat sacs from Sumatra. Uh, followed by um, Agile Gibbons, also from Sumatra, Java Gibbon from Java, um, and then in red and sort of yellowish at the top um, are the species from Kalimantan, from Borneo. So at least it gives us an idea of where the animals are coming from, and tracking where they're going is far, far, far more difficult, because once... Um, the potential for a sale is, uh, is agreed, then everything moves on to a WhatsApp number or a private messaging account, which we just can't track. Um, as you see, just in terms of age, the vast majority are juveniles, so under two, a few adults, um, and the unidentified ones, again, sometimes because of the conditions they're kept in, they could be older than they look, but because of the conditions, we just we can't tell. But clearly, it's youngsters. However, what we are starting to see when it comes to reporting on this within the Indonesian media, and this is across online media, um, uh, print and um, television and radio, is that it's starting, obviously the pandemic impacted it, but it's starting to be reported more, highlighted more as the fact that this is wrong. Across their range, gibbons are protected in every single country. Um, so the fact that it is becoming something that the media themselves are reporting on is positive. When we look at um, prosecutions, so red is the number of cases. Um, uh, the green is whether it, is it, is whether it was a live given, um, and blue is whether it might be a live given and or parts. Um, and we're definitely seeing more of a trend in prosecutions taking place and prosecutions which have led to a conviction. And that's, got, that's definitely, definitely encouraging. And again, looking at... Um, oh, sorry, this has been engaging. Oh, well. Um, uh, yes, so in the uh, 
green is the number of uh, cases brought to court. Um, sorry, green is the number of prosecutions and yellow is the number of cases brought to court. So not everything is resulting in a conviction. Um, but the convictions are increasing, sadly, of course, are the number of cases being brought to court. But what can we do? Well, through uh, Gibbonesia, which you can just Google that, Gibbonesia, it's all in Indonesia. This, the whole point of this campaign is a campaign of positive non-ownership. Instead of going out and telling everyone that they are bad and evil and wrong for doing this and that they're breaking the law, which they are, it's all about protecting Indonesia's natural heritage, keeping the animals in the wild so that it becomes more of a, um, a celebration of the wildlife rather than constantly wagging the finger at people and telling them, telling them they're wrong. And we are starting to see some results. We're starting to really see a lot of impact particularly with um, um, interventions with uh, lawyers, police, the, um, I don't know the, what's the English word, I guess, yeah. uh, the wildlife authorities, um, is that uh, before the training, the majority of sentencing was less than a year or up to a year. Most, at most, you start to see the sentencing after the training has increased because Again, this is all within the law, but before the training, they were being given the minimum sentence. Following the training, there's an increasing use of at least up to the, the highest sentencing, which was up 37 to 48 months. So that's good. I mean, Gibbons themselves, they're not, they're not being sold for as much as orangutans, certainly, but when you compare the cost of a Gibbon, which is quite, um, quite varied, uh, compared to the um, average monthly salary in Indonesia, and this is based on the uh, minimum wage under Indonesian law, um, the cost of a given is still fairly high. We also know that the annual offtake is not sustainable. To get a baby given, you have to kill the mother. You kill the mother out of a paired unit, what happens to the surviving male and any other offspring? Unfortunately, with that, we just don't know. This is extrapolation. So yes, you've got infants coming into the trade, but we don't know the knock-on knock -on impact in the wild. But the processes of reducing demand really are working. A lot of it has to do with reaching out to the um, social media networks, uh, sorry, the social media uh, platforms. And it's not just about sale of illegal wildlife. There's a lot that we need to talk to them about. But reaching out to people, what's the incentive to buy, sell, or have a gibbon? Why is it? Is it a status symbol? Is it because a celebrity or an influencer has posted a, something on TikTok on their, on their um, motorbike driving around Jakarta with a gibbon on their shoulder? Um, which has happened. Um, but then we also need to think about the consequences is, okay, we've got this campaign, Gibbons are coming into the rescue centres, great, but can they cope and who is going to pay for it? Where is the funding going to come from to support the rescue centres throughout the entire process? And bearing in mind that many Gibbons they receive may not be able to go back to the wild. They may not meet the criteria um, to return to the wild. Oh, Bangladesh should be in yellow. Um, so yes, there's no rescue centres at the moment in China, none in Myanmar, but yes, we do have now in Bangladesh. So pretty much everywhere um, there are rescue centres, which is good because that means that these issues are being tackled. It's bad in the sense that we need to do it. So where are they coming from? Um, there definitely appears to be a trend in who's, in who's buying them, it's disposable income, but the source is communities working and living in and around a uh, given habitat. So we know through this positive, this campaign of posit positive non-ownership worked with Pukanku, which was a, a campaign for slow lorises, it was very, very effective, so this is what we're trying, we're replicating with um, the gibbons. 
again, coming back to the tourist um, guidelines, these are all from uh, photos in Thai beaches prior to the pandemic, but it's starting up again. Um, animals, not just gibbons, being used as photo props. Don't do it. So there's lots of ways of working together to deal with this. Obviously, um, working with the, the social media platforms, working with communities, working with law enforcement, um, and also raising awareness among people who are giving funding to conservation organizations, particularly in, um, in, in rescue centers and, and zoos, that this is an increasing problem. Um, and we need to do something about it. And one of the big organizations that we're working with is the Association for Countering Crime Online, who are just completely on the ball, including uh, environmental lawyers and others, to try to deal with this. And again, it's not just Gibbons, it's a whole raft of things that are being, uh, oh, illegal activity is happening online. So yeah, targeting um, current and prospective ownership, owners, why not have Gibbons as pets? EOCA, Association for Cancer and Crime Online, are being incredibly proactive about this. And yes, we have more rescue centers, but that also means that we have more capacity to deal with the problems and we have more ways of learning. And what is so, so important is it's very difficult to care about something if you don't know about it. So using education for the conservation of gibbons, how we actually get this message out there, how we tell people about these amazing singing, swinging apes. So couple of examples. Um, so this is the Skywalker Gibbon, Hulok uh, Tianjing, which literally does mean walker in the sky, uh, the, the Chinese name. Um, this is a project uh, called Cloud Mountain Conservation. Uh, it's a community-led NGO in China, and it's the only NGO, uh, sorry, the only Chinese NGO specifically working for the conservation of the Skywalker Gibbon. And they are doing absolutely incredible work. Um, they are getting recognized, at least at the regional level, by the Chinese government. Um, and one of their team was over here uh, last month um, attending the Primate Society of Great Britain conference, presenting about the work they're doing with communities. And again, a lot of their work relates back to people's um, the culture, cultural significance of gibbons within these communities. Why that did that? Oh yeah, here we go. Um, so yes, Gibbon Outreach, International Gibbon Day, always on the 24th of October. Um, but really bringing, bringing, the message, uh, bringing the message to people in their own language and giving people actually tools of what can be done, but equally asking people what are the barriers to conservation that they see that means conservation might not be being as effective. So people are really, really involved. Um, heading back to uh, Borneo, this is the project that I did my PhD with, the Gibbon uh, Rehabilitation and Rescue Centre, Calloate. Um, I don't know why it's doing that. And they really thought outside the box. Um, they started Radio Calloate, which basically became the Radio 1 of Kalimantan. There was like happy hour, there was... Um, uh, take the mickey out of the foreigner hour because their, um, their, their founder is French. Um, they've now got uh, Callaway TV, they've got their YouTube channel, uh, and this is making a huge difference because every so often whilst playing the latest music, there are little messages in there about conservation. And just focusing back again on Borneo, so we've got four, uh, four species which, if you're not careful, do actually look really similar. But again, understanding their behaviour, understanding what we can do in terms of what they need, because what they need is what we need to know to be able, in order to be able to protect them. So this is some of our long-term work, um, looking at basically what part of the forest the gibbons use. And they really like to stay in the same place. They are extremely territorial. Uh, unless, and unless disturbed by uh, some sort of human influence, they'll stay in pretty much the same place. 
Um, that's uh, going back to 2006. And again, you, this is the triangulation method, looking all very sciencey. Um, but basically, that, this is what it is. You've got a bunch of people sitting out in the forest in a triangle, again, up before the gibbons. Uh, so, uh, yes. Field work is challenging. So, again, you always do this in pairs. So, each of those three um, listening post points, you always do it in a pair of people, basically to keep each other awake. Because um, falling asleep, asleep in the jungle, your, your body knows that you've done something really stupid and it knows that there's probably something out there that's going to try and eat you, so your body just doesn't relax. But basically, you get up, you're in pairs for safety. And this is how, again, you can use this method to look at the variation and see, okay, um, this is in East Kalimantan. The, the numbers are actually going up compared to 2012, and then 2018, we've actually got more groups. But again, always thinking about their, uh, their singing and the science of thinking about what time of day. I um, keep hearing from colleagues who work on gibbons further north. Of, yeah, the gibbons don't wake up until 5.30. I'm like, get a lion. I've got to get up at four. But still within this, there are about many species that we just don't have good population data for. So one of our big gaps is um, Hylobates abati, which is mostly found in the Malaysian, Malaysian Bornean province of Sarawak. I need to speed up. Okay. Uh, right, very quickly, to the swamps, favourite place. This, um, we had some fairly hideous fires in 2015. Um, basically, again, looking at the mapping, so this is the Sabina National Park. Uh, that was in red with the areas lost to fire before 2015. And then after four months of very, very severe fires uh, in sort of winter 2015, the red on the, the right is how much was lost. That was with pretty much all the conservation work stopping and at least 100 people firefighting almost 24-7 for three months. Lovely picture of a given. Unsurprisingly, um, these fires produce a lot of hideous smoke. That was taken about 8 o'clock in the morning when the sun should be, should be shining. Funnily enough, when the gibbons are, are breathing in this toxic smoke, as are we, um, they start coughing. And again, they don't really like to sing. So the singing to defend their territory is hugely important. So they still do it, but they just do it for a much shorter period of time and they sing far less. So instead of that long, lovely, hello, we're here, don't come here, because we're going to fight you, it's, we're here, don't come here. Much, much shorter, much more condensed. Again, long-term effect, we're not really sure what that is, but we do know that everybody breathing in this toxic smoke is not good. But yes, there is hope, there really is. It's hugely complex, all of these problems, and just thinking about the swamps, multiple threats, multiple problems, multiple drivers. Therefore, we have to think at different levels, but it all has to be underpinned by science. It has to be underpinned by what we know about what we're trying to protect. So it's key that we have local leadership, integration, capacity building, and working with communities at all levels, actually on the ground, conservation efforts, and the monitoring and evaluation is what we're doing working. To scale that up to the um, policy level, action plans. We started doing these in 2019, and we were going to have them every country, all species in every country, loads of plans for everyone to get together and have lots of chats in person. Obviously, that didn't work. So a lot of this was actually done online. And there's a couple of lemur people in the room basically um, got the action plans for many given species had existed for many they didn't. Very few places had full countrywide uh, action plans for all their given species. An exceptional model was done with, um, with the lemurs where they got everyone together and they discussed all of the issues 
And instead of just saying, here's what needs to be done, they actually put a number on it. What was it going to cost to do it? Um, and a great deal of funding was actually raised for that because the actions were very clear and how much it was going to cost to implement it was very clear. And pretty much all the experts were involved. There were lots of workshops. As I said, clear budget and clear responsible who was going to do it. Not just, we need to improve law enforcement, but clearly how it was going to be done. And we're getting there with the Gibbons. So we've got 11 countries to do, so it's taking a while. We've got three done so far. All of the experts are involved from each country. Every piece of information is included, whatever language it's been written in. All the consultations are happening. We've got budgets and we've also, at the moment, um, the Indian, Malaysian and Indonesian action plans are completed and are now with their respective governments for, we hope, approval. Um, don't worry about that, that was just the details of how we did it. And so what we're doing again, everybody is involved. So it doesn't matter how old the information is, we're making sure that everything is in a spreadsheet so nobody can say that their information was not included. And this is why it's so important to make sure everything is there. Everybody has a voice. Um, so there are country coordinators leading everything in each country to make sure that it is bespoke for each country. What is doing, what is working in Indonesia may not work uh, in Bangladesh. Other things may need to be brought in. But again, when they're all finished, um, they're going to be freely available uh, on the SSA website in um, the national language of whichever country and English. So ultimately, particularly for a swamp, you have to keep the peat wet. Wet peat doesn't burn, wet peat is good, even though it's particularly challenging to move around in, for us anyway, as humans. Certainly for the gibbons, it's incredibly easy. Other ways that we're sharing information is through another IUCN publication, it's the top 25 list the, t the list of the top 20, it's called Primates in Peril now, actually. Um, and again, it's shared from expert opinion. And these top 25 are not necessarily the 25 most endangered in terms of numbers. If that was the case, it would always be the Hainan Gibbon that would feature. But it's the primates from across the world that maybe people don't know about the general public and that could benefit from this lovely publication that highlights them and says, right, actually, let's give a bit more attention to these because it really, really does generate income, which generates action for conservation. Um, and again, these can be found on the IUCN, no, Primate Specialist Group website. Um, yes, I'm nearly finished. Um, Gibbonesia is, it is all in Indonesian, but I'm sure you would all love to go and practice your Indonesian, so that would be fine. Um, but yeah, gibbons.asia is, uh, is the SSA's website. Um, and if you are interested in anything else about Borneo Nature Foundation, again, you can practice language skills. Our social media is in English, Indonesian, and French. Um, so yeah, lots of things for hopefully for you to go and look on. And I I think I might have gone over a bit, so I'm very sorry about that, but thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very, very much, Susan. We've got time for maybe a couple of questions. Do we have any, if, uh, of course we do. I was about to jump in with one, but um, um, we'll, we'll have one and two then. So let's go ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I think we're, we're fairly uh, used in uh, making documentary today to get some idea of what um, chimps and kind of gorillas and, uh, and orangs are like, uh, personality wise, character wise. Um, I, although they're an animal creature, I have no real idea of what gibbons are actually like. Could you tell me that? Yeah, maybe I should have done the walk. They are 
goodness, where do I start? I, we've got another hour. Um, we'll get you the pub afterwards. They don't really, they've never been seen to use tools in the wild. I would argue that's because they don't necessarily need to. They've got a very shortened thumb. So although they are, they can still do this, they don't need to use tools. They can go through the, cat, through the forest at, we think, about 22 uh, kilometers an hour, literally flying at some points where they're not holding onto anything. And they can still grab onto a branch and keep going. They're the F1 drivers of the primate world. They are super smart. They do not like, um, they have no patience, which is probably why they go so fast. When gibbons have been given puzzles in uh, captive environments, if they can't do it within a few minutes, they will literally just try and throw it away. Um, they're incredibly curious, although they don't seem to mind camera traps. An orangutan will go up to a camera trap or a macaque or try and eat it. Uh, gibbons will just kind of hit it and, and walk away. Um, they are incredibly family orientated. Um, their play behavior is fantastic. It's like, <laughs> um, the little ones. Um, goodness, I've never had that question before. That's amazing. They're just magical. And they're singing. There is nothing like hearing their singing in the morning. Um, nothing like waking up to it. Nothing like being out in the forest when they wake up. Um, but yeah, they have no patience. They definitely have no patience. Two questions. If you could ask them maybe um, together and then, um, Susan, if you could take the answers together. That yes. Would be brilliant. Yeah, fantastic. Very quick question. Caught for the pet trade, are they caught for bushmeat? Yes, they are. For In some places, the gibbons do are part of traditional medicine. Um, in the Mentawi Islands off the west coast of Sumatra, yes, west coast of Sumatra, uh, they are traditionally hunted as part of the uh, rite of passage for boys to be, yes, that's right, boys to become men, not men to become boys. Um, again, but that's particular to the islands of Mentawi. Um, but in uh, Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam, they are, um, there is a, a, a trade in, in meat for traditional medicine. In terms of traditional bush meat to eat them for uh, protein and, and as meal, no. And we'll have the, the last question. How long did they live for? Um, the oldest gibbon that we know of in captivity lived to 63. The oldest one that we know of in the wild lived to 49. That was in Thailand. And the one in captivity was in the States. So the people who buy them were expecting to have them as pets for... I think, unfortunately, when anyone buys a primate as a pet, they don't realize quite how long they're potentially going to have them for, which is also a problem for the rescue centers, because any gibbon that cannot be released and is rescued when it's sort of two years old, that animal needs a home for life. So the rescue centers, of course, will provide that. But that is financially very challenging. Yeah. Um, got, well, financial donations are always welcome. But to be honest, tell people about them, especially the, the photo prop trade. When people go abroad, um, and I can share links with you to go on the, the, the mailing list, but when people go abroad, don't have an photographs taken with any wild animal. Um, you know, that really does exacerbate the animals being brought out of the wild. Um, and have a look online. Again, I can share the links with the, the, these guidelines for tourists about how to be a good tourist. We're not saying don't go and see primates in the wild and don't be a tourist. But, you know, have a read of these. And then you can also then pick when you're looking for somewhere that uh, is selling packages or the opportunity to go and see primates. You can see if they're doing it in the best possible way. Because, again, with all of this, if they're doing it right, they're not only helping the animals, they're helping local communities as well. So, yes, money is always welcome. And please check out our social media, various social media. But it also is really important about awareness and how... We all behave, and I, I include sort of professionals like me. Um, you know, we're, we, the conservationists, we have to practice what we preach. So when we do this, we have to do that as well. So the awareness about, yeah, please go and see primates in the wild. They're amazing. But do it responsibly. Great.
Well, thank you very, very much, Susan. Could we have a big round of applause?